tonight we have a title which may surprise any of you. It's called of Cards and Shadows. And please allow me a little bit of time as I share my screen. Okay, Huishan, can I confirm? Are you watching my screen? Yes. All right. All right. Of cards and shadows. If you are familiar with the Dhammapada, in the very first collection of verses of the Dhammapada, you will find the first and second verse in the Yamakawaga, the twin verses, and verse one and verse two talks about cards and shadows. Now the Dhammapada. I have a Dhammapada here in four languages, Pali, Malay, English, and Chinese, because I think a day will come whereby the use of all four languages would probably be crucial. But it is actually the first and second verses of the Dhammapada that initiated my interest in Buddhism. The Dhammapada is from the Puttaka Nikaya, a potpourri of books, very old and relatively new. But the Dhammapada is among the oldest books in the Pali canon, dated close to the time of the Buddha. And I was interested in religion and philosophies from a very young age, and in fact spent many years studying other religions. And it was actually my coming across the first and second verses of the Dhammapada that speared my interest in the Buddha Dhamma. Because if you look at the first and second verses of the Dhammapada, you will see that its teaching, its lean, it's completely different from what one finds in other religions. And for me, then as a young man and a search, it was something really radically different. And it struck me as what I would really want to find out more. So what does the first and second verses of the Dhammapada say? It says, if one with a wicked mind speaks or acts, because of that, suffering follows one, even as the wheel follows the hoof of a draft ox or as a cart follows the hoof of a draft ox. That means the oxen pulling this to lock cart. And verse 2 says, if one with a pure mind speaks or acts, because of that, happiness follows one, even as one's shadow that never leaves. Now, there are many translations of these first and second verses. But basically, the translations all agree along this line that if one with intention does something, be it wholesome or be it unwholesome. If it is unwholesome, then dukkha follows one by this cart, which is being drawn by an oxen. And if one with a wholesome mind speaks or acts with that intention to do good, because of that sukha, happiness, follows one, even as a shadow that never leaves. Now, these two verses are actually extremely profound because it goes way beyond what we superficially read. And hence the topic that I'm discussing tonight of cards and shadows. It goes way beyond what most people will just read and say, okay, if I do good, I get good. If I do bad things, I get bad things. 
That is an extremely superficial understanding of these two verses. Now, the word that is used in these two verses, very importantly, we must understand. Because the Buddha is very precise when he comes to choosing words to describe the mental process or the activity of our mind. Three words are commonly used. One is vinyana, the other manu, and the other citta. And I place, I put great tribute to the late Venerable Punaji who taught this and explained this very well to us. Vinyana is used when the Buddha wishes to talk about the process whereby we are perceiving or aware of things. So I'm conscious, I'm able to perceive that process is vinya. Now the word manu comes from the same root word as manusya. So we are manusya because you and I have the ability to think you and I have the ability to debate within our mind as to what is good, what is bad. We are able to cognize the thinking process. And hence, the word manu is used when intellectual or interpretation or analytical activity is going on with regards to what is perceived. And so this same word, manusia, as in human beings, because we have the ability after evolving the neocortex to argue, to, lo to logically deduce, to come up with works of beautiful music like Mozart, beautiful literature like Shakespeare. And finally, citta. Understanding Malay, we understand citta much better. Sukacitta, for example, or dukacitta, for example, they're all Pali words. So chitta is with reference to the affective process or our emotional reaction when we are perceiving something. So if I perceive durian, my chitta is, wow, nice food coming. I feel so happy. Well, Sister Eileen, if she sees durian, she runs for her life because her affective process is one of revulsion. So the Buddha was very specific with his words. And in the first and second verses of the Dhammapada, the word the Buddha used is manu. Manu. Kubangama Dhamma. Which is often interpreted as mind is the forerunner of all phenomena. But that word mind goes beyond and much more above the English word mind. Because here the Buddha is saying, Manu, our intentional decision, our decision after analysis, after cognition, after interpretation, and we say, I want to do this. That Manu, that cognitive process of reasoning, argument, debate within our mind, coming to a decision to do or speak something is the forerunner of all things. This Manu is the chief. If this Manu has an impure intention, then when we act either through body or speech, Dukkha follows us like this car which is being drawn by the oxen. And similarly, in the second verse, Manu, Kubangama Dhamma. It is this intellectual process, this cognition, understanding, interpretation, debate, logic, rationalization, and finally decision. These precede our action through speech and mind and, 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 and body. And if our intention is wholesome, good, then happiness 
follows him like a shadow that never leaves. So I hope this very important part is understood. Binyan, Manu, Chitta. In the first and second verses, the word used is Manu. So it is Dr. Surya's intentional decision after her cognition, her rationality, her argument, and her decision to do something that gives rise to this coming consequence or karmic chain of events. So manu, kubangama dhamma. So the late Bhante Punaji interprets this as cognition precedes all experiences. It predominates and even creates them with unwholesome thought if one speaks or acts, then pain follows as the carriage or cart will follow the animal that drags it. And the opposite, if you do something with full intention, wholesome, and then it's like a shadow which follows us. Now, an ox pulling a cart, there is not even a moment's reprise be it bright or dark, a smooth road, or a pothole track, or a muddy track, dukkha is there. The burden of dukkha is ever present until the cart is unyoked from that poor beast of burden. The difference being only the degree of pain and suffering. So when we have a toothache, there is not even a moment's reprise. It's either more pain or less pain. And until the dentist fixed it, the only difference is the degree of pain and suffering. All right, so much of our dukkha, we moan and we groan, we complain bitterly because it is like that. We are very aware of it. It does not leave us. However, on a good road, a nice smooth road, the load may feel easier to bear, while on a bad track, the pain is many fold more. So even if it is dragging a cart or a carriage, the conditions still come in. Whether it's a good road or a bad road, uphill, downhill, all these conditions will also affect that dukkha that is being born by one. Now a shadow. In verse 2, the Buddha used a shadow as the metaphor. Now a shadow is weightless. We do not even feel its presence unless you decide to take a look on the ground and your own shadow. How many of us pay attention to our shadows? None of us in all reality, in all honesty. So actions that we have done, wholesome ones, that results in, for example, good vipaka or fruits, they follow us weightlessly, like that shadow. And many a time, we may not even be conscious of it. So a lot of times, good things happen to us, but we never look back and say, ah, it is this that I did which has resulted in this good thing. We just take it for granted and celebrate. I used to often say, most of us, if not all of us right now, do not have a toothache. How many of us are ever grateful that at this point, we do not have a toothache or migraine or something worse? We just take it for granted. But dear, Dhamma brothers and sisters, also be aware that there are good reasons that the Buddha used a shadow as the metaphor. Because when is a shadow most prominent? A shadow is most prominent when there is bright light. A shadow will disappear when you enter a dark room. So it is obvious that you need the condition of bright light for a shadow to be prominent. 
you will not have a shadow in the shade or a dark room. So while we may have done good things in the past resulting in good seeds being planted, whether that seed comes to fruition depends on whether we are giving it the right conditions to flourish in the condition whereby you continue to do good in the bright light or bright karma, your shadow will be strong. While if we deviate from the path, then dark karma, a shade, a dark room, and even the past good deeds disappears, like a shadow that disappears and may not come to fruition. So this is something important for us to realize whether we are creating a perpetual haze of dark clouds because of greed, hatred, ignorance, or we are doing good things, allowing good seeds planted previously to come to fruition. The consolation is a shadow will return as soon as you are in the light, no matter how long a shadow is missing. And we are, of course, similarly, or dragging along our cutloads, our carriages of suffering. We are also having our weightless shadows. We have a mixture of both. And while we complain about our dukkha, as it is distinctly felt, we very often fail to appreciate our sukha. We fail to thank our parents, for example, for giving us so much happiness. We fail to thank our teachers and so many people who are responsible for giving us the happiness that we have. So please remember that in the Buddha Dharma, karma is directly linked to the motives behind an action, an intentional action based on our manu, our intellectual, our rational thinking mind. Motivation usually makes the difference. Do you do, did we do that act because we want to help or we want to harm? Based on greed or non-greed, based on hatred or kindness or metta. So karma is merely the cause, the seed that we plant. And this intention gives rise to good or wholesome, or not so good, or unwholesome consequences in the future, just like this. So please remember, karma is different from the result of karma, which is also called vipaka. Karma is just the cause in the chain of cause, condition, and effect. And as mentioned, whether its intention is wholesome or unwholesome, that is what we are doing. That will give rise to results in some distant future or near future. Now, all of our intentional actions will leave a mental imprint. To put it in modern psychological languages, it's a mental imprint in our mind that we leave. I like this, oops, sorry. I like this. You know that sequence of metal balls hanging? And then you lift the first one, you let it go, and it goes knock, knock, knock. This remains stationary while the furthest one will swing. And if you put this in a place where there is no gravity, no air, no friction, this will literally go on eternally. It will not stop our karmic seeds, that mental imprint is something like this. So whether it's an action through the speech or act, we will create this mental imprint. But the Buddha made it also clear that if it is an involuntary, unintentional action, then that does not create the karmic seed, because volition or chetana 
the most important factor in determining karma is absence. In the Anguttara Nikaya, the Buddha said, intention because is what I call action. For true intention, then we initiate these actions through our body, speech, and mind. And there is coming consequences that will, under the appropriate conditions, come to fruition in various realms. And the Buddha made it very clear that I am the owner of my action, inheritor of my action, born of my action, created by my action, and have my own actions as my judge. And whether I do good or evil, I will feel the resulting effects of that. So if we are to be asked, who is our creator? We are created by our company. Because of the force of these seeds that we plant, it may be a beautiful garden or a garden full of weeds or a very messy garden. But we are created by the very actions that we do. Now, it is very, very important to know that based on what I just shared, karma is the entire opposite of fate. Because with karma as an intentional action, the Buddha unmistakably puts our free will in shaping our future in our hands. Because at every moment, we are creating new karma, planting new seeds. We are at every moment changing our future. Our faith is in what we do today, tomorrow, yesterday. And at every moment, this is changing our future. We are rewriting our biographies before they happen with every act that is intentional. So it is very important to realize that the Buddhist teaching on karma is the opposite of fate. Fate means you can't change anything. The Buddha's teaching is you can change everything. So while this gentleman called Subha, the son of a Brahmin, asked the Buddha why there are differences between us and among us, some are rich, some are poor, some are long-lived, some are short-lived, etc. The Buddha said that we are all the owners of our karma. We are all the result of our karma. We are the consequence of our karma. We are created by our karma. So when Sister Hui Shan studied art for her college exams, and she get good results, that karmic seed which she has planted is going to alter the rest of her life. Her entire next 50, 60, 70 years is changed just because she studied very hard for her college exams. So why are we different? Because we had acted differently in the immediate past, the not so distant past, and the distant past. That's why we are not the same. That's why some are intelligent, some are not so intelligent, some are rich, some are poor, some are long-lived, some are short-lived, the Buddha said. So the American Declaration of Independence is wrong. The Declaration of Independence start that we hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We all know that this is not by any means even close to what is written. For more than a hundred years, there were slaves in America. For more than 200 years, there was never a black man in the White House until quite recently in 2008. So it is obvious that we are not equal. And why we are not equal is because of what we have done in the immediate past, the not so distant past, and the distant past. We have all created different seeds 
and under different conditions, it had come to fruition. Now, it is very important. And hence, I repeat that it is karma that is done in the past is not inevitable with unchangeable consequences. No, no, no. We can easily and at all times change what had been done in the past. And the Buddha was quite clear in his teachings on this. The other things which are important is that the Buddhist teachings on karma is quite radically different from what was common consciousness at the time of the Buddha 2,600 years ago. For example, the Buddha said, no, it is not everything due to karma. Karma is just one aspect of what happens to us. And how karma vipaka, the fruits of karma unfold, is beyond our human mind to try and figure out because it is so extremely complicated, each affecting the other. And certainly karma is not fate, is not deterministic and certainly not fatalistic. And a very important teaching that the Buddha gave, which sadly not many people repeat, is that karma can be modified, as I said, and even more important, extinguished. I hope, dear Dhamma family here, that you realize that the entire purpose of we walking this noble path, besides giving us harmonious living now, ultimately is the extinguishment of our karma. And I will explain more on this. Now, in the commentaries, you have this pancha niyamas, the five law or orders. This is commentorial, it's not in the suttas. But in the commentaries, they look at it as five processes which affects our physical and mental state. Karma is only one of them. So you have uttu niyama the physical order, the laws of physics. You have bija niyama, the genetic order, our genes. So if I'm having Chinese parents, I'm going to look Chinese. If I have Indian parents, I will look Indian, etc. Dhamma niyama, small d, phenomena, the order of the norm. Chitta niyama, the order of mind or psychological causation. Let me explain just a little bit further. So karma niyama, which we have been talking about with regards to cause, action, and then condition and effect, this we know. Uttu niyama, the physical order, like all the physical conditions of rainy weather, cold weather, lightning, etc. Bija, genetics, you cannot plant rice and expect to Harvest tomatoes, for example. Chitta, the word chitta, same as in Malay, sukha chitta, dukha chitta. Our emotional states, our psychological state. And Dhamma Niyama, the order of natural phenomena, natural causation. So, the Buddha clearly refuted when he was asked whether everything is due to karma. Because 2,600 years ago, some people think that everything is due to karma and that this is immutable. And if you are born into this class, you are stuck in this class. The Buddha said, no, this is not correct. And he challenged us to ask ourselves, ehi pasiko. He said, so then owing to previous action, Men will become murderers, thieves, unchaste, liars, slanderers, babblers, coverters, malicious, and perverse in law. So if you believe in the immutability of karma, then there is no hope for any one of these people. All right? And then 
those people who had these deeds, there's no hope for them because they are unable to change anything. And so there will neither be the desire nor the effort to improve themselves. So the Buddha was very, very clear that the fact that brother Joseph Ong can become and will become an Arahan one day in the future is because brother Joseph Ong can change his karma. That whatever unwholesome deeds he had done in the past can be nullified. If not, there will be no hope because we will all be stuck. Now, please remember that with regards to physical orders which affect us, a question that is so often raised in forums, in sharing, is the tsunami our karma? Is the earthquake our karma? No, 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 dear Dhamma family. The tsunami of the earthquake is just because the earth moved. It is not karma, but it is natural phenomenon. I still remember very clearly when the huge tsunami occurred in the Indian Ocean and the late Chief Venerable was asked, why so many hundreds of thousands of people died? Is it their karma? And the late Chief Venerable replied, no, it's because the earth moved. And I think that that is the most precise explanation. Our karma then is how are we going to respond when dealing with such a state, just as how we are going to respond in the present pandemic. That is what we will be creating as a result of this natural phenomenon. What are we doing? We are creating karma. So the Buddha very, very clearly stepped away from the idea of fatalism or predeterminism wrong. Buddhism teaches cause and effect, not things that are determined. And the Buddha rejected three things. First, past action determinism. That means whatever is done in the past, you can't change. It's immutable. The Buddha said wrong. If in that case, there will be no hope for any of us because we'll be stuck. A bad man will always be a bad man. All right, a bad act will always affect you negatively. The Buddha said, no, that's not true. Whatever is in the past, while it has an effect, it can be changed. The second is the istic determinism. That means some God determined that you are going to go to heaven. Some God has determined that you are going to go to hell. Some God has determined that you are going to be stupid. The Buddha said, no, this is not true. And the third that is built by Buddhism and taught by the Buddha is called accidentalism, which means everything is by chance. And the Buddha said, no, that is not true because things occur by cause, condition, and effect. It is not completely by chance. And I still remember being taught by Ajahn Brahm he said, there is no such thing as coincidence. There is no such thing as, oh, how coincidental. He said, no, things are not coincidental. Things are because we create the cause, condition, and a result has come about. So please, brothers and sisters, if there is one thing you bring home, is everything the result of bad past karma? The answer is no. If everything is the result of past karma, then whatever we do now in our spiritual life will not change anything. It will be useless. And that would be determinism. Is our future determined by some gods who say that you are in what class or caste? No. The Buddha clearly said, this is not true. Our lives are created by our actions. While we do not control all, much is within what we intentionally do. Of course, as I mentioned just now, there are other things which affect us. From the commentorial tradition, you've got that five things. 
In the Abhidharma, you've got the 12 pairs of Pratana. So there are many things which affect us besides coming. So every time we intentionally do something, we actually modify our stream of consciousness. Just like you made a decision to attend this sharing tonight. If I am successful, your stream of consciousness, your line of thinking would have changed slightly. The person we are now is very much what we had done in the immediate and distant past. That is what creates us now. I used to wear thick spectacles, high myopia. And because of my cataracts, I had to go for surgery. That decision to do surgery has now changed my need to wear thick spectacles. I'm only wearing blue filter lenses now. So every time we make a decision to do something, we are changing a little bit of our present. So what we do now will make the person we will be tonight, tomorrow, next month, next year. What we do at every moment, brothers and sisters, please know, will change our future. There's a sutta, a pretty short sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, called the Sword Crystal Sutta, which I hope everyone here will be familiar with, because it's a wonderful way in which the Buddha taught us about karma. Basically, the Buddha said, if you are to take a lump of salt, a lump of salt, and you throw it into the Ganges River, and now you take back, let's say, a cup of water from that Ganges River. 2,600 years ago, the water was fit for drinking. And now he said, you drink it. Will it be salty? Well, the answer, of course, everyone said, no, no, no. Because of the great mass of water, it will not be salty. And the Buddha said, you put the same amount of salt, the exact same quantum, into a glass of water. Dissolve it. And now you drink that water. Will it be salty? Yes, yes, of course, they said, it will be salty. Now, this metaphor is a fantastic way of teaching us of the effects of the seeds that we plant. This, for example, could be a good or a bad act that we have done. But depending on the conditions, the amount of water, that good or bad act may or may not come into fruition. So our past karma does not invariably ripen because of this. It is not always the case and neither is the consequence the same because these conditions, our overall character, our personality, what we have done will have made a change. The Buddha even gave another example here. He said, all right, let's say Brother Joseph Ong has durian plantations. Or right, I know for sure. Um, Sakya In chairman has durian plantations. His family's durian estates. So if somebody is to go into that durian estate, whom he has never seen before, doesn't know, and the dog started barking, they came out and they saw this man stealing the durian. What would be the likely consequence? The dogs will go after him, the man will probably get caught, all right? But the time being a kind man will probably give him a scolding and let him go. Not so kind person will bring him to the police, a ruffian might beat him up, etc. But let's say now it's brother Joseph Ong, long-term resident of Malacca, well-known among the Malacca people. And he's the one who is taking the durian. And Brother Tan comes up, sees Joseph and says, hey, Joseph, what are you doing? And Joseph says, oh, I've come to sample your durians, my friend. I heard it is wonderful. And what will likely Brother Tan do? Oh, welcome, welcome, Joseph. Do take some home for Brother Punya as well. The very same act, but different outcomes because the conditions are different. So the Buddha said, 
that the amount of salt could represent good or represent unwholesome actions, but its consequence can be very different for two different persons, depending on the conditions, the fruit will be different. Now, since the workings of karma is so dynamic and every moment changing, so is our so-called fate or destiny, not fixed, but dynamic. We have the free will to completely overcome whatever past unwholesome deeds by refraining now and in the future to lots and lots of good wholesome acts. It is like dissolving a lump of salt that is unwholesome in the mighty waters of the Ganges. All that mighty water is the good deeds. So the overall state of mind can dilute its consequences. Let me give you an extreme example. I think of us here are familiar with the story of Angulimala. Personally, I do not think he killed a thousand people, 999. I think it's a, again a metaphor. He probably did kill some people. So if karma is immutable, Angulimala will rot in hell for the rest of eternity. But because karma is dynamic, Angulimala on awakening, on enlightenment, has actually erased, has actually terminated all that unwholesome negative karma. And that's why he can become an arahant. If karma is immutable, cannot be changed, then Angulimala will not have a ghost of a chance of becoming an Arahant. Now the Buddha taught that there are four types. He taught clearly that there is dark karma with dark ripening. There is bright karma with bright ripening. And then there is a combination of dark and bright karma with dark and bright ripening. So we are clear about this. This is really pure evil, pure greed, pure hatred. This is pure altruism, which is sad to say, hardly exists. Most of us do acts with a combination of dark and bright karma. That is, while we do lots of good deeds selflessly, a lot of the times that good deeds is tinged by what do I get out of it? What is my future return? Aha, I sure have very good life because of this. Aha, my son sure get good girlfriend, etc., etc., etc. So this is what the Buddha said, a combination of while it is bright, we still have that ego, that self, that what do I get out of it, that tinge of greed. And because of that, the result is a mixture. That's why you have dark and bright. Right. You all may remember the story I've taught many a times. When Bodhidharma went to China, he had such a huge reputation as an enlightened master that the emperor Liang Wuti, Liang of the Liang dynasty, asked, to meet him. And then Liang Wuti asked the Venerable Bodhidharma three famous questions. But the first question is what is important here today. The emperor asked Venerable Bodhidharma, I have done so many good deeds. I've given land to so many monasteries. I've allowed so many monks to be ordained. I have given so much food. And in fact, vegetarianism in Mahayana Buddhism Chinese Mahayana Buddhism is because of Emperor Liang Wuti. He gave imperial edicts which mandated that all the monks and nuns must be vegetarian. So he did lots of good things. Nobody disputed that. So he asked the Venerable Bodhidharma, all these good things I've done, how much merits do I have? 
The venerable Bodhidharma looked at him without a blink of his eyes said, none whatsoever. Zero, kosong, ile. The emperor, of course, was not too pleased. It was only much, much later when he consulted his own teachers that they told him that Bodhidharma is right. As long as you are doing things with a mind of thinking, how much merits do I have? Your 15 minutes of fame is all it brought. So this is number three, a mixture of both. Now, what the Buddha teaches to practice is the karma that is not dark nor bright. And this karma leads to the end or exhaustion of karma. This is not something we talk about often. I think we should be talking about this much more often because what the Buddha taught goes beyond one, two, and three. He wants us to have the end of karma. And this, the Buddha said, what is the practice leading to the end of karma? It is just the Eightfold Path. Right will, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right stillness. This will lead to the ninth, right insight knowledge, and the tenth, right liberation. And right liberation is the end of karma. So why do you assume that bad things should not happen to good people? Often I get asked this question, again in sharings and in forum. Oh, so-and-so has been such a good man. Why did such a bad thing happen? Oh, so-and-so has been such a wonderful kind man. How did he end up with such a horrible illness? Now, the reality is, why not? I remember in my early years, I read what Venerable Sumedho taught. In his monastery in England, a lady was with a very sick child. And the lady asked the Venerable Sumedho, look around, see all the other children, they are so healthy. Why is my child always so sick, hopping away? Venerable Sumedho, without even a blink, replied, because he is born. It took me a while to learn that lesson, but that is the truth. As long as you are born, whether it's Dr. Surya, Brother Ju Singh, Joseph, whoever, you are going to have the first noble truth, aging, sickness, death. No one can escape. Sun Lao Ping Su. They are part of this parcel of life. So the reality is, why not? Why are you immune? I often will use this description that you being a vegetarian will not stop a bull from charging at you. All right, think about it. This is important. Remember, karma is only one thing which affects us. There are many, many other things. You in the path of a bull is a wrong choice. So let us avoid unwholesome deeds so that we do not create the conditions for it to pull for us to be like that oxen to pull a heavy cart. Let us continue to do meritorious deeds. All these are familiar to every one of us. These meritorious deeds under the right conditions will come to fruition. They are our shadows. We may not even remember these deeds after we have done it. It does not matter. How many of us remember our shadows? We don't. And please remember, dear Dhamma family, all the good things we have now, all that sukha that we have is a result of what we have done today, yesterday, last week, last month. In the Buddha's teaching, it is all overnight rice. It is what we had done today, yesterday, last week, last month. It is all overnight rice. 
Now what we do is creating new rights. So it is entirely up to us to live our lives. Karma will take its effect accordingly. Now, karma is of course accumulative, like that pendulum with the many metal balls. If you put it in a vacuum and no gravity, it will go on eternally. It will not stop. The only reason it stopped is because of friction and gravity. So good karma will lead to good conditions and results. Bad karma will lead to unfavorable states and most of our action is a mixture as I explained. Please Dhamma family, take home this message. Our awakening, our enlightenment leads to the end of karma. Typically, we do not think of ending karma. Most people will think, ah, I do this good act, good result. Ah, I do this good act, ah, I will be happy, I will be well, blah, 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 blah. But the Buddha's teaching of the Noble Eightfold Path, beyond harmonious living now and in the present, is the way that leads to the end of karma. Instead, we are expecting to rely on it instead of trying to end it. In the Buddha Dharma, we aim to be liberated from it and not to carry the burden of karma anymore. So to be beyond karma is what I'm sharing now. And that seems incredible to many people, but the complete set is not eightfold path. It's a tenfold path of 10 right things. The Noble Eightfold Path of right view up to right stillness with the addition of right insight knowledge and right liberation. What is this liberation? It's the liberation from all that binds us to samsara. So among the four kinds of karma that I taught just now, what is important is the fourth kind. And Nibbana is freedom from karma and its results. Nibbana is freedom from samsara. So merits, which is a poor translation of the word punya, which means all kinds of actions that cleanse and purify the mind of the doer. If you can understand what I shared just now, how can merits be shared? Because punya is good karma. We must remember the Buddha teaching us. I am the owner of my karma, heir to my karma, creator to my karma, etc. So how can it be shared with others? I often joke that if karma can be shared, when I die, I am going to will and distribute all my bad karma to all my good friends. Of course, it cannot be done. It is not like a cake which can be cut into pieces and handed out here, you saying this is yours. Here, yeah, Joseph, that's yours. Instead, what we are doing is not sharing, but dedicating one's punya to other beings. For example, somebody has passed away. We had a sister whose mother passed away. So we asked her, please, we are having this session tonight. We have informed her we are having this session tonight. We will be dedicating merits to your departed mother. In this dedication, please rejoice. By rejoicing in this good act, in this cause, she creates her own right of good karma. That will lead to the direct cause of her happiness. So while this work, which I've taken directly from the book, transferring of merit is so often used in our texts which are translated. Actually, this is technically wrong because you cannot transfer. You can only dedicate in Pali Anumo Dana. Anumo Dana, rejoicing in others' good deeds.
Now we float around samsara like a cock that is pushed by waves. Our karma keeps us recycled endlessly again and again. Now let us end this. For awaiting us is not eternal life. Some people will offer you eternal life. Tell them, please, very politely, that we are not interested in this eternal life because we know we are already in the midst of eternal life. And we are trying to get out of it. So if you wish, please carry on and enjoy yourself. We have done it and we want to get out of it. I wish to end here. Thank you very much. And as I mentioned, tonight's sharing, I'm particularly thinking of two persons, which Sister Hui Shang will mention in name. One of them is very sick. And I wish to dedicate whatever good in this sharing to this brother, that he may have the right doctors, the right treatment, so that he may have peace, that he may have happiness, and he may have relief from his sickness. Thank you very much, Dhamma brothers and sisters.